Good afternoon and welcome to Rediscovering the Truth. I'll be your host and teacher, Marquita Smith, and I'm continuing to teach in a series about Yeshua in the Gospels. Yeshua is the name of the Son of God in the original Hebrew. It means Yah saves. And Yahweh is the name of the God of Israel. He speaks it in Exodus chapter 3 when he's talking to Moses when he says, Who should I say is sending me? He says, I am, or I am that I am. And he speaks those four letters, um, yad Hey vav Hey Yahweh, um, and that is, that is his identity, that he is everything that we need him to be. He's all-encompassing, all-powerful, all-knowing. And in Yeshua's name, basically, in, in the literal translation, his name, Yeshua, is I Am Salvation. So I'm very excited about that. We're, we're looking at through the Gospels to really see the Jewish Messiah being revealed in them. We're in the book of Luke, and so today we'll be reading Luke chapter 7 through 12, because we did 1 through 6 last week. As we continue in Luke, we're actually just seeing great revelation about the Lord just ministering to us. And so today we're going to look at faith for revival. I'm excited about this, um, particularly because I'm personally going through a revival, but then also because I see God's people being revived in my region. I'm in the Tidewater area of Virginia, which is the birthplace of the United States. Uh, we've got the first landing in uh, Virginia Beach and the second landing at Old Point Comfort in Hampton and then the, the third um, uh, location where the settlers were in Jamestown, which was the first permanent settlement um, in North America for the English colonists. And so it's just a, a beautiful place to be where the Lord is just doing great things to turn this region back to himself. But as this region turns back to him, so does the nation. So, so goes Virginia, so goes the nation, um, as we've always been the leader of this nation. At, at one point, the entire nation was just called Virginia. <laughs> and so it's just been uh, beautiful to, to watch what he's doing in Virginia and for my, myself to watch him revive me personally. He's reviving faith, hope, and love in me. Uh, he's reviving passion in me because I am excited because I'm getting married soon. A wedding is coming. I'm really excited uh, because we are marrying the Lord. I'm having a wedding and you can have a wedding. And it's just exciting, this, this renewal of our commitment and passion for him. We're actually going to do it on Yom Kippur, which is October the 4th this year. It's a Saturday. Uh, begins sundown Friday and, it's, and it continues to sundown Saturday on October 4th. And I'm just so excited about that because we're going to be immersed in the York River. Uh, then we're going to walk through the hoopah, the uh, wedding canopy, and um, commit ourselves or recommit ourselves to the Lord as his bride, which is just an exciting time. Because as I'm preparing for this, he's just wooing me. He's bringing me out of dark places. He's reviving in me a right spirit, giving me a right mind, focusing me in on his will. He's just visiting me in my times of worship and prayer. I mean, revival is just beautiful. But I'm telling you, God always wants to revive us. He always wants to put life into us, to re-infuse our life into us, to invigorate us, to regenerate us. He's always desiring to resurrect life from death in our lives, in our souls, um, in our ministries, in our careers, in our businesses, in our families, in our marriages. He's always looking to resurrect, to revive, to bring back to a place of life. Um, but we've got to meet him where he's working and have faith for the revival. Uh, First uh, Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17 talks about the fulfillment of Yom Teruah, which is also known as Rosh Hashanah. Um, but the biblical name uh, for that feast day is Yom Teruah, which is a day of sounding. And on that day we sound the shofar. And in 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 through 17, uh, Paul actually speaks of the great shofar sounding and Yeshua cracking the sky. And then those who are dead in Messiah, they rise first. And then those of us who are still alive, we are, are caught up together with him to meet Messiah in the air as he's coming to rule over the earth. And we get to tabernacle with him um, and, and co-reign with him. This is, of course, fulfilled also. Or you see it revealed in Revelation chapter 20. Now, what's exciting about that um, is the fact that there is life there from the dead. We receive transformed bodies. We're taken into a new state with the Lord. And revival is just like that, where he transforms us and not to something necessarily new, but into his original plan and purpose for us. He changes us really back into who he designed us to be. And that's what's happening in me right now. That's what's happening in my region. And I'm seeing it. Um, I had a, a meeting with pastors 
today and there was just this excitement about revival. Uh, we're going to cry out to God in prayer and fasting and weeping this Saturday, uh, September 20th at World Outreach Worship Center at 9 a.m. in the morning. But then we are also going to have a wedding rehearsal dinner where the family is going to be united. It's called a Uniting of Families. The next day, September 21st at 5 p.m. Um, at Buckrow Beach. And there is just this excitement about what God is doing, how he's uniting us and bringing us together and revealing his will. There is an excitement about the fact that he's calling us to pray and even weep and mourn before him, that we would be honest about our transgressions and that he would heal us um, and, and forgive us of our sins and heal our land, heal the region, heal the territory, uh, heal this birthplace of the nation, that healing can go forth from uh, the Tywood area of Virginia throughout the United States. I'm so excited about that. But as I was stating with you, um, the, to bring forth this revival, to birth it or to be used in its birthing, We've got to do what we're going to do when Yeshua comes. We've got to meet the Lord in the air. Meaning I've got to be above my earthly circumstances, above that which is in um, the Olam Haze, which is this present world. I've got to be above that. I've got to be in the air with him. I've got to be on cloud nine and not in a, in a place of fantasy, but in a place of faith-filled love and worship for him. Uh, a heavenly, praiseworthy uh, worship that is above what is beneath. And so I'm caught up together with him in the air. I'm worshiping him on a higher level, in a higher plane. My faith is just believing him for miraculous outpourings and miraculous signs and wonders. My faith is just believing him to give me the desires of my heart as they are lined up with his heart's desires because he doesn't want us to suffer and to be dead in our spirits, but he wants us to be alive in him. And so I'm really excited about today because we're going to look at that as we're reading through Luke chapter 7 through 12, and we're going to read all of that in the complete Jewish Bible. But as we're looking through it, I'm going to highlight those points where people have opportunities to meet Yeshua in the air, to, to have that, that, that higher level faith where they connect with him, and then revival comes down to their loved ones, comes down to the land, comes down to the earth, comes down to their own souls. And so I pray that you would have that type of, of revival faith, that type of, of, of elevated expectation of what God would do, to not just think about it and dream about it, but to meet him with action. For James says that faith without works is dead. And so if I'm believing God for revival, that I'm starting to, to produce fruit in keeping with that faith. I'm believing that he's moving greatly. I'm believing for a great outpouring. I'm believing for a change in my own heart and mind in areas where I may have been rebellious toward the Lord or malfunctioning in sin. I'm believing for deliverance and healing and, and all types of things in me and and that's what we've got to focus on and keep our eyes on no matter what's happening in the world around us. No matter what challenges come, no matter what chaos or destruction we may see, we can have a revival in our spirits and release that into our regions so that people are drawn to Yeshua because he is being lifted up and then he's drawing all men to himself no matter what these outward circumstances may look like. And so I'm just excited about that. I pray that you're excited um, that you're planning to join us You know, this Sunday at 5. It's on our website, truthandspirit.com. Org, uh, for the wedding uh, on October 4th, for the wedding feast throughout Sukkot, um, October 8th through the 16th. I mean, I just pray that you will pray into really being a part of what God is doing and connecting with us. We're doing something next week for Yom Teruah. Um, next Thursday at 12 noon, we'll be here because it's a no work day. Um, and we're going to be delivered. We're going to experience seven deliverances individually. Hallelujah. We're going to worship the Lord and we're going to receive from Him our recommitment to the covenant, the vows that we're going to speak when we walk through that hoopla on October 4th. And so I just pray that he just continues to minister to you um, through various sources, but particularly through this teaching today, that you might be uh, encouraged in your faith to believe him for revival. So let's get into the scriptures. Luke chapter 7, starting in verse 1 in the Complete Jewish Bible. It reads, when Yeshua had finished speaking to the people, he went to Capernaum, which is Capernaum. Um, a Roman army officer there had a servant he regarded highly who was sick to the point of death. Now, this is the place where we can look for revival. When we see death or near-death experiences, we see things are dying, that's when we should have faith for revival. This is when we should expect God to bring things back to life. Hearing about Yeshua, the officer sent some Jewish elders to him with the request that he come and heal his servant. They came to Yeshua and pleaded earnestly with him. He really deserves to have you do this, for he loves our people. In fact, he built the synagogue for us. So Yeshua went with them. 
He had not got gone far from the house when the officer sent friends who said to him, Sir, don't trouble yourself. I'm not worthy to have you come under my roof. This is why I didn't presume to approach you myself. Instead, just give a command and let my servant recover. For I too am a man under authority. I have soldiers under me. And I say to this one, go. And he goes. And to another, come. And he comes. And to my slave, do this. And he does it. Yeshua was astonished at him when he heard this. And he turned and said to the crowd following him, I tell you, not even in Israel have I found such trust. When the messengers got back to the officer's house, they found the servant in good health. Now, I love this particular uh, uh, scripture where it speaks of this faith of the Roman centurion. Because though the Jewish... Uh, uh, Officials and Jewish elders at this point thought the centurion was worthy of this revival, worthy of this blessing. The centurion did not count himself worthy. His faith was not dependent on his worthiness for the revival. His faith was based off of Yeshua's will and ability. He believed that it was Yeshua's will to revive his servant. And he believed that it was in Yeshua's power and authority to do it. And that's where his faith met Yeshua in the air. And that's why it came to pass. Not because of self-righteousness. Not because of, of anything within of himself. But because of his faith only in Yeshua. And that's where revival is going to start and where it is sustained. And our faith in him, not our faith in ourselves. So let's continue verse 11. The next day, Yeshua, accompanied by his Talmudim and a large crowd, went to a town called Naim. As he approached the town gate, a dead man was being carried out for burial. See, more death, opportunity for faith in revival. His mother was a widow. This had been her only son, and a sizable crowd from the town was with her. When the Lord saw her, he felt compassion for her and said to her, Don't cry. Then he came close and touched the coffin, and the pallbearers halted. He said, Young man, I say to you, get up. The dead man sat up and began to speak. And Yeshua gave him to his mother. They were all filled with awe and gave glory to God, saying, A great prophet has appeared among us, and God has come to help his people. This report about him spread throughout all Yehuda, Judah, and the surrounding countryside. Now again, we see revival, death, and then life. Life rising up out of the ashes of that which was dead. And the blessing here is that it, again, it didn't come out of uh, anyone else's worthiness. It didn't come out of their works because all they were doing was going to bury the dead man. It was the Lord himself who had compassion on the woman and saw all the mourners and said, I can do something about this. I can bring life from this death. And he can do the same thing in our lives, in our ministries, in our region and territories. He can have compassion on us and say, come back to life. But we've got to agree with him in faith and allow him to do that work in our lives. Verse 18. Yochanan's or John's, Talmudim, that's disciples, informed him of all these things. Then Yochanan called two of his Talmudim and said to them, and sent them to the Lord to ask, Are you the one who is to come, or should we look for someone else? When the men came to him, they said, Yochanan the Immerser, also known as John the Baptizer or John the Baptist, has sent us to you to ask, Are you the one who is to come, or should we keep looking for someone else? Right then he was healing many people of diseases, pains, and evil spirits, and giving sight to many who were blind. So he answered them by saying, Go tell Yochanan that you have been see what you have been seeing and hearing. The blind are seeing again. The lame are walking. People with zada'at, which is going to be an infectious skin disease like leprosy, are being cleansed. The deaf are hearing. The dead are being raised. The good news is being told to the poor. And how blessed is anyone not offended by me. Now this is so essential because John is at this time, he is actually in prison because Herod, of course, um, uh, has been has imprisoned him. Um, and this is not going to be Herod the Great, the father. This is Herod Antipas, the son, has imprisoned him because he'd taken um, Herodias, his, his sister-in-law, to be his wife. And John had spoken against it. So he's been imprisoned now and his ministry has ceased. And so that time that he has with the Lord is being stifled in this prison environment. So even John's own spirit is starting to die and he needs revival. So he goes to the right source. He sends his Talmudim, he sends his disciples to Yeshua to ask, should I keep hoping? 
Should I keep hoping in revival? Should I keep hoping in Mashiach, Messiah, the anointed one to save us? Or should I give up this hope? Because he's starting to lose that faith. He himself needs revival. So Yeshua says that you are blessed if you're not offended by me. If you don't fall away on account of me. Look at what I'm doing and let that revive your faith. He sends back this message of revival of faith back to Yochanan right before he's actually about to be killed. Which is important because he wanted to, to, to leave this earth in that place of faith. This is what God's will is for us, us and it was, of course, Yochanan's will for himself. So he sends out this desperate cry to Messiah to just be encouraged. Now, this is the same man who saw the Spirit descend upon Yeshua like a dove. He heard the Father say, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. So he really knows who Yeshua is. He was the baby in his mother's stomach who leapt for joy when Mary shows up and she's just conceived the Messiah. So he really does know who Yeshua is. He's his six-month older cousin. He knows who he is. He's heard the stories about him, but he's at a time where he's in a desert place in his faith. All of us have experienced those times, but when he got there, he knew exactly what to do. He reached out to Yeshua. That's what some of us need to do. We may be in a desert place in our faith where it's not looking right. And in our minds, we know God. We know his will. We've heard it. We've written it in our journals. It's been prophesied over us. But we're not seeing what we expect to see during a time of revival. So where do we go? We go to Yeshua. We go right to him and we say, Lord, should I keep hoping? Should I keep having faith? Should I keep holding on? And he is going to say yes. And then he will give us miraculous signs and he'll give us wonders and confirmations that will revive our faith so that we can stay in our positions and do what we're supposed to do to receive the blessings that he has for us. Because that doubt is a trick of the enemy. The whole point of that doubt is to get us to move out of our position so that we instead have a self-fulfilling prophecy. I stopped believing in God's promises so I, I reposition myself so that I can't receive the promises. This is exactly what the enemy wants to be done, but John knew what to do. He said, I'm going to seek, I'm going to seek the Lord. I'm going to reach out to him. And he couldn't leave the prison himself, so he sent messengers. Ask this question for me. Is he the one? Should I keep hoping? Or do I need to look for something for someone else? Ask God the question. Don't be so religious that you don't share your doubts and your fears with him. Because now Yeshua is actually going to lift up John. He's going to exalt John because in his moment of despair, John did the right thing. He did the only good and holy thing. He released those doubts and fears to the Lord who is the only one who really can handle them. Verse 21. When the messengers from Yochanan had gone, Yeshua began speaking to the crowds about yoking. And what did you go into the desert to see? Reeds swaying in the breeze? No. Then what did you go out to see? Someone who was well dressed? But people who dress beautifully and live in luxury are found in king's palaces. New. No. And that's going to mean of course not. Instead is what new means in the Hebrew. So what did you go out to see? A prophet. Yes, and I tell you, he's much more than a prophet. This is the one about whom the Tanakh, the Old Testament says, See, I am sending out my messenger ahead of you. He will prepare the way before you. I tell you that among these born of women, there has not arisen anyone greater than Yochanan the Immerser or John the Baptizer. Yet the one who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. Now, right here you see that when John reached out to Yeshua, the fact that he gave his doubts and fears to him brought Yeshua to a place to lift John up. When we give God our doubts and our fears, he doesn't stomple us down. He doesn't uh, criticize us. He doesn't uh, 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 bend our, our, our bending backs. Instead, what he does is he lifts us back up because he's excited that we came to the right place. To have our doubts and fears addressed. Yeshua has moments of doubts and fears. We saw that in the Garden of Gethsemane. But he went to the right place. He went right to the feet of the Father. And we've got to follow that same model. Because we will have trials. We will have tribulations. But we go to Yeshua. We go to the foot of the cross. We go to the throne room of God. And we receive that encouragement for our souls. Verse uh, 29. All the people who heard him. This is Yeshua. Even the tax collectors. By undergoing Yochanan's immersion, immersion acknowledged that God was right. But the Parashim and the Torah teachers, by not letting themselves be immersed by him, nullified for themselves God's plan. So Yeshua himself is speaking. And he's speaking about Yochanan, about John. And what he's saying is, those who went to him to be immersed, 
They were uh, ratifying, they were connecting with God's plan in the earth. Those who thought themselves already righteous, those who thought themselves religious, unholy, they didn't go and be immersed by yoking in. So what they did was they nullified God's plan. They did not receive the outstretched hand of the Lord for them. We don't know what God is doing or how he's going to do it. All we can do is follow the glory cloud. All we can do is what the Holy Spirit, the Ruach HaKadosh, speaks in our ears and just follow those steps, even when it seems crazy, even when it doesn't seem to match up. Like, you know, why are you having me do this? Doesn't make sense, Lord. That, that, that doesn't gonna do, that's not going to do anything for us. We might not understand his plan. Follow the Spirit. Because the, the sinners that followed the Spirit and went to this barbarian caveman looking guy, because he's, he's, he's unkempt. This is this yoking in the immerser, John the Baptizer. He's got this camel hair garment on with a leather belt wrapped around his waist. He's eating locusts and wild honey all day long. And he's camping out in the desert by the, the, the Jordan River. That's strange. And he came from a family of priests and they would have been well kept and they would have had flowing robes and all this. But he went against the grain and he looked really unusual and, and people would not have understood if they were being religious. Why we even need to go to this guy? But those who were really drawn in their hearts to repentance, they received the immersion, that baptism in the water that their sins might be washed away. Hallelujah. And because they did, when Yeshua came preaching the good news of the kingdom, they were ready for that message. That's true for us as well. Let him prepare us for revival. Sometimes the things that are showing up make zero sense to us. It's like, God, that, that doesn't even match up. But when we say yes and we're just honest with the Lord and we're honest with ourselves, we are actually being prepared for what he's called us to do. And it's just amazing how that works out. He's doing it even in my life. Strange things are happening that I couldn't even explain. And had I not said yes to the opportunities that were given me, I'd be missing this opportunity for revival that I have right now that I'm smack dab in the middle of. It's beautiful and wondrous. And I can't even explain it. I'm so giddy. It's ridiculous. But it's, it's just because I'm following what God is doing. Stuff that just doesn't make sense to me. Doesn't line up with, with my religious thinking and, and my own plan. But those who are, are, are risky enough, those who are, are have enough faith to just say, okay, Lord, I'm not sure about this, but I know you're pressing me. I'm going to go. I'm going to move. I'm going to take a step. Those who do those things and really have a heart after God and, and are ready to repent and we line up our lives with the scriptures, those who are doing those things are preparing ourselves for the revival that's coming. We're preparing for that outpouring that he wants to give us personally and collectively. And he will rain on those who are preparing themselves for the rain. Hallelujah. Now, verse 31. Therefore, said the Lord, this is Yeshua still speaking, how can I describe the people of this generation? What are they like? They are like children sitting in the marketplaces calling to one another. We made happy music, but you wouldn't dance. We made sad music, but you wouldn't cry. For Yochanan has come not eating bread nor drinking wine. And you say he has a demon. The son of man has come eating and drinking. You say, aha, a glutton and a drunker, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Well, the proof of wisdom is in all the kinds of people it produces. Now, that's so be beautiful because in other versions it says wisdom is proved right by all her children. And others says wisdom is proved by the fruit. What Yeshua is saying here is that because you see that souls are being saved. And in the proverb says very clearly that he who wins souls is wise. <laughs> He's saying, clearly I'm operating in wisdom because souls are being saved. You think you know the wisdom that it takes to save souls, but you're not receiving this type of fruit in the kingdom. But I am. Thousands upon thousands. Yoking and also thousands upon thousands being saved, delivered, healed, set free. Their lives are turning away from sin and to God. And if it's producing this kind of fruit, how can we deny that it's God? This is what Yeshua is saying. So watch your lives even. For that fruit. If nobody's being drawn to what God is doing in you, then go back to him. Say, God, am I missing something? If it's not changing you, go back to him. And am I missing something? I'm supposed to be bearing some the fruit of, of Teshuvah, repentance. I'm supposed to be bearing the fruits of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. I'm supposed to be bearing uh, uh, the, the, the fruits of, of, of revival. I'm not seeing it in my life. Go back to him. Because maybe you've missed a step, you've missed some instruction, or maybe you've not believed in what he's doing. But that wisdom is going to prove itself by the fruit that comes forth from it. Now, uh, on to chapter, uh, no, we're still in chapter 7. Verse 36. One of the Parashim, the Pharisees, 
invited Yeshua to eat with him. And I love this part. I love it so much. It blesses me because I identify so much with it. And he went into the home of the Perush of the Pharisee and took his place at the table. A woman who lived in that town, a sinner, who was aware that she was eating in the home of Perush, a Pharisee, bought an alabaster box of very expensive perfume and stood behind Yeshua at his feet, weeping until her tears began to wet his feet. Then she wiped his feet with her own hair, kissed his feet, and poured the perfume on them. When the Perush, the Pharisee, who had invited him, saw what was going on, he said to himself, If this man were really a prophet, he would have known who was touching him and what sort of woman she is, that she's a sinner. Yeshua answered him. Now, it says that the man said to himself. <laughs> so he's not speaking to Yeshua. He's speaking to himself probably very quietly, but Yeshua is picking it up. So Yeshua answers him that which is already in his heart. Shimon, and that was his name, Simon. I have something to say to you. Say it, Rabbi, he replied. A certain creditor had two debtors. The one owed ten times as much as the other. When they were unable to pay him back, he canceled both their debts. Now, which of them will love him more? Shimon answered, I suppose the one for whom he canceled the larger debt. Your judgment is right, Yeshua said to him. Then turning to the woman... He said to Shimon, do you see this woman? I came into your house, but you didn't give me water for my feet. But this woman has washed my feet with her tears and dried them with her hair. You didn't give me a kiss. But from the time I arrived, she has not stopped kissing my feet. You didn't put oil on my head, but this woman poured perfume on my feet. Because of this, I tell you that her sins, which are many, have been forgiven. Because she loved much. But someone who has been forgiven only a little, loves only a little. Then he said to her, your sins have been forgiven. At this, those eating with him began saying among themselves, who is this fellow that presumes to forgive sins? But he said to the woman, your trust has saved you. Go in peace. And in other versions, it says your faith. Now, I love this story because I identify with the woman, not with the perush. I am one who's been forgiven much. And the reason I know it is because the Lord has me at a place where I take inventory of my sin. I come before him for the purpose of confession and repentance. And when I don't think I have anything to confess, I wait. And I let the Spirit reveal what I need to confess. Things I've done in the past, things I've done recently, things that are in my heart that I'm not yet committed. You know, I haven't done with my hands or with my body, but they're in my mind, they're in my heart. He, he reveals it to me so I'm able to confess. And when I do, he forgives me. This, this particular scripture has just revealed so much to me over the years. I confess, he forgives, I love him. And Yeshua said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. You will obey what I command. So that leads me to a place of obedience. I am empowered by forgiveness to obey God. If I don't confess... I can't obey because I don't love him. Instead, I'm believing in my own righteousness, which is what the Perush, the Pharisee, did. He believed he was good enough. He believed he was a good person. You know, I give to the, the poor. I fast. I do this. I do that. I say my prayers. I, and so he's believing in himself. So when we do that, we have a, a faith in our own works. And when I have faith in my own works, that those things are not going to get me to the place of salvation that I need to be in. And so because it won't get the fruit that I really need, which comes basically out of that confession and relationship, the restoration and forgiveness, which draws me closer, and I don't see that fruit, then I'm going to feel condemned. And when I feel condemned, I'm going to condemn others like he's doing with this sin sick woman. He's con condemning her instead of welcoming her into the presence of this, this, this holy man, into the presence of Messiah. So then when I condemn myself and I condemn others, I start to feel that no matter what I do, it's not good enough. And I'm in this horrible, horrible cycle of condemnation, works and, and not getting enough fruit of it, not feeling like it's good enough and estrangement from God. So that my self-righteousness eventually leads me away from God. That's going to take me to death. But confessing and then believing that God has heard and forgiven me, receiving that forgiveness is going to take me to a place of love. And that love is going to empower my obedience. That I can go and sin no more. Not because I'm trying to stop sinning. But because he puts it in me. To hate the sin. And to love the Redeemer. That's revival. That's real deliverance. That is everlasting and does not change. That's when your character has been transformed. Your mind has been renewed. It's not about me trying to figure out how to be holy. Because he puts holiness in me as I love him. That's what we should be praying for. 
And that's what he's promised us. It's not about my works or my righteousness. That's real. And that's lasting. That's salvation. That's what Yeshua came to bring to us. Hallelujah. I'm excited about it. Now we're in chapter 8. After this, Yeshua traveled about from town to town and from village to village, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. With him were the twelve, and a member, um, and a number of women who had been healed from evil spirits and illnesses. Miriam, called Magdalene, who was uh, Mary from, from Magdalene, um, from whom seven demons had gone out. Yochanan, the wife of Herod's finance minister, Kuza, Shoshana, and many other women who drew on their own wealth to help him. Now, I love that and I have it underlined because the Lord ministered that to me as well. So I identify very strongly uh, with Mary Magdalene or, 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 or Mary called Magdalat. I identify so completely with her because I know more than seven demons came out from me as he's been delivering and ministering to me. I know that was way more deliverance than just seven. Seven is going to minister that, that number of completion. But I know that there was way more going on in my soul than was going on in this woman's soul. And so from that point forward, as he has delivered and pulled me out, I have pledged to serve him, to follow him wherever he would go. And that if I have any resource, any wealth within me or in my life, it belongs to him. And you see, these women had that same profession. They were like, whatever I've got, if you need it that you can do for somebody else what you've done for me, you can have it. And that's the pledge that I've made. And it's the pledge that you see them making. It's the pledge that he wants you to make. He wants to do a great work in the earth, but he wants to partner with us to make it happen. As we sow, as we give, as we pray, as we fast, as we proclaim the truth to others, as we prophesy over them and give them words of knowledge, as we're compassionate and extend the hand of mercy to people, he is co-laboring with us to bring revival into the earth. Let him use you on today. Whatever little bit he's done to you, give it away freely because then you'll get all the more back in return. And this is what these women were doing. They financed Yeshua's ministry from their own storehouses, from their own careers and, 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 and savings. And whatever little bit they had, they gave it to him. And that's what he used to share this good news from village to village and town to town. He wants to use you as well. And you're giving and you're sowing and you're praying. Even if you want to sow into what he's doing in this ministry, go to truthandspirit.org. It's right there. Just click give it. Or sow into the ministry that's sowing into you that he can continue to bless others and even pour back into you because of your faithfulness. Verse 4. After a large crowd had gathered from the people who kept coming to him from town after town, Yeshua told this parable. And I love this parable. A farmer went out to sow his seed. As he sowed, some fell along the path and was stepped on, and the birds flying around ate it up. Some fell on rock, and after it sprouted, it dried up from the lack of moisture. Some fell in the midst of thorns, and the thorns grew up with it and choked it. But some fell into rich soil and grew and produced a hundred times as much as had been sown. After saying this, he called out, Whoever has ears to hear, let him hear. Verse 9. His Talmudim, his disciples, asked him what this parable might mean. And he said to you has been given the secrets of the kingdom of God. But to the rest, the rest are taught in parables so that they might look but not see and listen but not understand. And he's quoting Isaiah 6 then, Isaiah 6, 9, because this is, of course, the mission that was given to Isaiah. Now, verse 11, the parable is this. We're about to get the revelation. The seed is God's message. This is the message of the truth of the kingdom. The ones along the path are those who hear, but then the adversary comes and takes the message out of their hearts in order to keep them from being saved by trusting it. So their faith is wiped out because this, the truth of the word is stolen from them. Verse 13. The ones on rock are those who, when they hear the word, accept it with joy. But these have no root. They go on trusting for a while. But when a time of testing comes, they apostatize, which means they turn away from the faith. As for what fell in the midst of thorns, these are the ones who hear. But as they go along, worries and, and wealth and life's gratifications crowd in and choke them so that their fruit never matures. But what fell in rich soil, these are the ones, it, these are the ones who, when they hear the message, hold on to it with a good, receptive heart and by preserving by persevering, they bring forth a harvest. That's the type of heart that we want to have. We want to have the heart that is the rich soil. Where the word comes forth, it's grounded in us, it's rooted in us, and it takes 
fruit. It takes a root down below and it bears fruit up above. That's what he wants for each one of us. But we've got to choose to have a heart that perseveres, that does not give way in temptations and trials. We go back to the source that he can water us. And, and he is the true vine. We know that uh, very clearly from John 15. So I've got to stay connected to him that I might bear much fruit. If I allow the enemy to disconnect me through warfare and attacks and discouragement, then I'm going to wither and that word in me is not going to bear the fruit that it needs to bear in my life and in the lives of those around me. Verse 16. No one who has lit a lamp covers it with a bowl or puts it under a bed. No, he puts it on a stand so that those coming in may see the light. For nothing is hidden that will not be disclosed and nothing is covered up that will not be known and come out into the open. Pay attention then to how you hear. For anyone who has something will be given more. But from anyone who has nothing, even what he seems to have will be taken away. So we've got to take hold of what God has for us. Not just listening to the words, but really hearing in our spirits. Letting it take root in our souls that we might be changed and he can lift us up. That we can share that message with others throughout the land. See, that is where you're elevated. You get a, a place, a, a podium, a post where, where from which you can share the truth. And that may not be in a pulpit. It may not be in a classroom. It may be on the bus. It may be on the street corners. It may be at your job. It may be in your home. But he gives you a platform. Paul's was in chains in a courtroom. But it's a platform to minister to others the truth of God and to demonstrate it by his perseverance. That's what he has for all of us. We don't know what it is, but he will put us up on a stand so that others can see the light of God within us. Verse 19. Then Yeshua's mother and brothers came to, him, to see him, but they couldn't get near him because of the crowd. It was reported to him, your mother and your brothers are standing outside and they want to see you. But he gave them this answer. My mother and brothers are those who hear God's message and act on it. Now, this is a big deal because this is Yeshua's physical family. And what he's saying is at this point in their lives, they weren't taking his word and applying it rightly. We see in John that his brothers didn't believe. We read earlier that Mary is treasuring all these things up in her heart because she's got to really make sense of all of it. And so the revelation hasn't completely hit them yet. They're like, he's just going crazy. You should be at home. What are you doing out here with all these people? So they went to come and collect them and bring them back home. They didn't understand this message that he had and that this was the season for it to happen. For 30 years, he lived at home among them just like everybody else. But in that 30th year, he goes forward and he he's, he's changed forever. He doesn't go back home as that same person. He doesn't go back and just rest with them and enjoy family life and, 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 and create uh, what he was creating as a carpenter and a mason worker. He doesn't do that. Instead, he's committed to this message of God and that was new for them. They didn't understand that. But he has told us very early that if you've been given a seed and you sow it, then it's going to bear more fruit in you. But if you've been given something and you don't use it, it's going to, that light is going to become dim. It's not going to bear fruit in what you have even is going to be taken away. So he admonishes us that when you get revelation, share it, meditate on it, proclaim it, read more about it, study on it, because then it will continue to develop in you and it will grow and grow and grow. But if you don't fan that fire into flame, it will go out. We need revival. We need what's in you. We need the message he's spoken to you. Fan it into flame. Share it with others. Reason with others. Read the scriptures. Research them and looking for uh, uh, things that will help increase your faith and what you've heard the Lord say to you. That's essential because then you will bear more fruit and he'll give you even more revelation. But if you take that revelation, you put it under a bowl and you don't do anything with it, even what you have will be taken from you. Verse 22. One day Yeshua got into a boat with his Talmudim, his disciples, and said to them, Let's cross to the other side of the lake. So they set out, and as they were sailing, he fell asleep. A windstorm came down on the lake so that the boat began to fill up with water, putting them in great danger. They went and woke him, saying, Rabbi, Rabbi, we're going to die. He woke up, rebuked the wind and the rough water, and they calmed down so that it was still. Then he said to the Talmudim, Where is your trust? Awestruck, they marveled, asking one another, Who can this be that he commands even the wind and the water and they obey him? Now, at this point, they've seen him do all types of miraculous things, but this one for them, it took the cake. They didn't believe that he could raise the dead, but he could, they didn't believe he could quiet a storm, that he would save them. They, they figured because he's sleeping at the moment, he's not attentive to our plight. And a lot of times we feel the same way Lord, where are you? 
Are you even going to answer? Are you going to do anything for me? Are you going to show up? What's happening in my life? He wants us to trust him in the midst of everything that's going on. Do we pray and call it to his attention? Sure. But we do that combining it with faith. Not in a place of doubt. Believing that he's hearing and he's already planning to show up. That the answer has been released in the heavens. We're just looking for the manifestation of it in the earth realm. That's faith. Where are you working? Who are you speaking to? Who has the word for me? What scripture is my scripture? What do you want me to do that I can meet you where you're already at work in the earth? This is what we do. We proclaim the truth of God with our mouths and we believe it in our hearts that we might see the manifestation. That's how we trust. That's how we receive revival. Verse 26. They sailed on and landed in the region of the Gerasenes, which is opposite the Galil. So that's going to be on the other side of the Sea of Galilee. As Yeshua stepped the shore, a man from the town who had demons came to meet him. For a long time, he had not worn clothes, and he lived not in a house, but in the burial caves. Now, this guy is alive, but he is dead. He's dead in his soul because he's living in a cemetery, and he's possessed by a legion of demons, which we're about to see. So this is, again, a great opportunity for revival. Some of us may have been that way. It's so interesting. So I was actually going for a jog this morning, which you haven't done in a long time, and I was feeling this revival in my spirit, which I've been just experiencing like all week. It's so crazy, actually. And I remember saying to the Lord how sad it must have been for people in my lives to just watch me die slowly over these past few years. Because I've been sort of fading away. I've been, you know, surviving, doing what needs to be done. You know, no, everything I know to do, disciplined in my prayer life, disciplined in fasting, disciplined in, in, in reading, reading the scriptures every day. But the things that brought me life and joy... I wasn't worshiping like I used to. I wasn't dancing. I wasn't singing. I wasn't uh, uh, just 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 blessing the Lord with everything within me. Not like I used to. It started to fade because my hope was decreasing. I was hitting challenges with trying to unite the body of Messiah. And this one is scattered. And this one has a problem with this one. And, and I was receiving challenges in my personal life. The enemy shows up every time I'm seeking God for revival. And it was all these challenges that started to damper my hope and damper my faith. And slowly those things were just bringing death to me. Each of us have experienced those periods in our lives. This guy was in a sustained period like that. And it was so sustained that it had to, it had begun to draw demons to him. And those demons were drawing him to a place of death. So he's living in a cemetery. If you start to see things dying around you, that's a great opportunity for revival. You need the Lord to bring you back to life. And then through you, he'll speak life into everything else that's going on. This is what this guy needed. And surely it was not the demons that brought him to Yeshua. It was a little spark of light within him that brought him to the feet of Yeshua. Because the demons would have run the other way. They knew who Yeshua was. We're going to see that in a minute. They would have gone the other way away from him. But he presents himself to Yeshua because whatever little spark of hope was still in him, it pressed against the legion of demons within him. It came right to the feet of the master. And that's what we've got to do. Press your way. This weekend, I remember crawling to the throne of God, crawling to him. And he said, just extend your hand. And as I did, I touched the foot of his throne and he just reinvigorated me with something that I hadn't had in a long, long time. Whatever you got to do to press your way, you do it. If you got to go through hell and high water, you do it. David said, if I made my bed in the depths, you will be there. He is there. You push. If a demonized man with a legion of demons, and he was a Gentile at this point. Yeshua said he'd come for the lost sheep of Israel. But this is a Gentile pressing his way to God, living among the caves naked and filled with demons. And he can find his way to the Messiah. Surely you can. Surely you can. And not just in the future, right now, today. Press your way to the foot of his throne. Press your way and just touch him. Just reach out for him. Just cry out and he will answer. Let's see what he's doing in this guy here. It's all it's so amazing. I love this. Now, I'm going to start again in verse 27 because I want to read it all together. As Yeshua stepped ashore, like soon as his feet touched the ground. So he's in the region and everything in the region knows that Yeshua is there. A man from the town who had demons, not one demon, demons, demons came to meet him. For a long time he had not worn clothes and he lived not in a house but in the burial caves. Catching sight of Yeshua, he screamed, fell down in front of him and yelled, Yeshua, son of God, ha el yon, that's the most high. 
What do you want with me? I beg you, don't torture me. Now, it's so interesting. Because the demon, of course, is not seeking Yeshua. The man is. And the man is being drawn. But the demon is crying out because he's scared. He's afraid. And that's exactly what's supposed to happen. When the Lord shows up, demons fear. They tremble. James says they know who he is. And they tremble with fear. This is what we see happening right here. Verse 29. For Yeshua had ordered the unclean spirit to come out of the man. It had often taken hold of him. He had been kept under guard, chained head and foot, but had broken the bonds and been driven by the demon into the desert because the demon doesn't want the man to get free. The demons like their host and they're not trying to let their host go because it's more pleasant for them to have a host because then they can do stuff in the earth. Without a human host, demons can do nothing in the earth realm. We've been given dominion in the earth. Read Genesis 1, 26, 27. We have dominion on the earth. Demons have no power except that they use a human. So they'd rather be in a human. Now watch this. Verse 30, Yeshua asked him, now he's talking to the demon, what is your name? Legion, he said, because many demons had entered him, entered the man. They begged Yeshua not to order them to go off into the bottomless pit. And we're going to talk about that in a minute. Verse 32, now there was a herd of many pigs feeding on the hill and the demons begged him to let them go into these. So he gave them permission. The demons came out of the man and entered the pigs, whereupon the herd rushed down the hillside into the lake and were drowned. Now here's the challenge. The demon thought they were getting off. I actually was talking to somebody about this the other day. So they asked to go into another live host. They knew Yeshua was not going to send them into another human. Because he came to save the lost. He's not going to put somebody else into bondage. So they said, let us go into the pigs. But when they went into the pigs, because they had been drawing this man so far into death, the death and the curse of sin went with them into the pig, and the wages of sin is death. So the pigs were then immediately drowned, which was not the demon's plan. Because now they're still cast out. They still have no host. Now that these demons, that the pigs have been drowned, the pigs are dead now. They don't have a host anymore, a living host anymore. And there's nothing they can do in the earth, which sends them right back into dry, arid places, which is not where they want it to go. Now, <coughs> excuse me. let's look back at 31, where they begged him not to send them into the bottomless pit. And the bottomless pit is the abyss. If you read in Revelation 20, it is the place where the enemy, Satan, the adversary, is going to be cast during the millennial reign. When Yeshua shows up, he cracks the sky, he's going to put him in the abyss, and it's going to be closed covered over top of him. Now the abyss in the spiritual realm, it actually exists in the natural as well, is like a black hole in space. It is black dark nothingness. There is nothing. And demons who have not been released or demons who, have, who are being held captive because the Lord is not allowing them to come forth, they are held in the abyss. The abyss is not the place we think of as hell right now. Because there is a holding place where the enemy is, where you know there's fire and it's hiding. But he is training troops in that particular place that we call uh, Hades, uh, and what we look at to be hell now, shall all the place of the dead. It's 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 connected to that place of the dead. Now the abyss is a place of torture. It's confusion and nothingness for demons. And there are all types of demons in the abyss. There are the, the monstrous, beastly kind. There are the, the those that are a little more cunning and wise that have more of the wisdom of, of, of a man um, in those places. And they're all just rubbing up against each other and they can't see anything and they can't smell anything and it stinks and it's, and it's hot. It's like solitary confinement to the, to the hundredth power. It's horrible. So he doesn't want to go there or the demons don't want to go there. But Yeshua didn't send them to the bottomless pit. But they still wind up having to go into dry, arid places. And this is important to note about humans. When we get free, the demons connected to us and to our region are cast out. They're cast out into either a dry, arid place that is torturous for them or the abyss, which is even worse. Because it is our sins that actually let them out of the abyss. When we sin, we empower demons. We actually call them forth. So when we repent, we're cleansed, we're delivered, we're sending them away. So to get us free, Yeshua sends them out. That we might live and they might experience those consequences of our sins, which brings to a place of death over and over and over, which is why they don't like it. They want to be in their host. So this is what they were thinking. Okay, we're going to go into the pigs, so at least we won't be suffering because we don't have a host. No, the pigs died. That sin just led the pigs right into a place of death. The death still exists. It doesn't stop. It's just taken away from us and put onto the demonic places where it should be as opposed to onto the humans who have been redeemed by the blood of Messiah. There's not redemption for demons. The redemption is for us. When we're disconnected from the demons, 
we get the blessings. And then that death, the sin and death goes on to them, which is why they don't want to leave. That's why deliverance is so challenging. And why people who are in the process of being delivered, they start sinning even more. They start, you know, just really losing it because the demon is doing its last ditch effort to not have to leave its host. But the power of Yeshua, his name and his blood, cast them out. That's what we need for revival. The demons need to go because they bring death. They bring deception. They bring bondage. Yeshua brings life and life more abundantly. Now, let's keep looking because there's more to this story. It's very interesting. Verse 34. When the swine herds, and this is going to be the shepherds of the pigs. You know, shepherd is the sheep, but they're the herders of the pigs. When they saw what had happened, they fled and told it in the town and in the country. And the people came out to see for themselves. They came to Yeshua and found the man out of whom the demons had gone sitting dressed and in his right mind. At the feet of Yeshua. See, he's at the right place. He's right at the feet of the Messiah. And they were frightened. Now, instead of being awestruck and, and, and put into this place of worship, they're scared. Those who had seen it told how the formerly demonized man had been delivered. Nobody can believe it. Verse 37. Then all the people of the Gerasene district asked him to leave them. For they had been seized with great fear. So he boarded the boat and returned. The man from whom the demons had gone out begged that he might go with him. But Yeshua sent him away saying, go back to your home and tell how much God has done for you. So he went away proclaiming through the whole town how much Yeshua had done for him. Now look at these different reactions. The one who's been delivered wants to stay close. The ones who lost their financial prosperity because it was based off of demonic activity and unclean things, they're herding pigs in the land that is actually Israel. And so that's clearly would have been unclean. And so they're, they're doing something that was, pro, that was prohibited by the Torah, but they don't care. They're doing it because it's profitable. They lose that profit. The man is set free, but they're not excited about him being set free. They're discouraged about losing the profit. So instead of choosing the Redeemer, who has proven himself, they choose the demons. So now those demons are being allowed to stay in the region, though Yeshua just cast them out. This is important for us to recognize. Because whatever we empower in our regions, that's what's going to be there. If we're welcoming the spirit of the living God into our region, he will be there. If we're at his feet, he's going to stay. But if we choose our sins and the demons connected to those sins instead, they'll stay. And Yeshua will leave. Because he'll be grieved. His spirit will be grieved. And the spirit of the living God will leave us. We don't want him to leave us. We don't want him to leave our region. We want to invite him. And as we invite him, he empowers us to sustain his moves in the earth. I just love it. I love it so much. Now, verse 40. When Yeshua got back, the crowd welcomed him, for they were all expecting him. There, Then there came a man named Yair. I love this one too. Who was presiding of the synagogue. Who was president of the synagogue. Falling at Yeshua's feet, the right place to be, he pleaded with him to come to his house. But he only had a daughter who was about 12 years old and she was dying. Again, opportunity for revival. We see death again. Verse. Uh, continue with that verse. As he went with the crowds on every side, virtually choking him, a woman who had had a hemorrhage for 12 years and could not be healed by anyone came up behind him and touched his titsy on his robe. Instantly, her hemorrhaging stopped. Now, the titsy, we talked about this before, is going to be the blue, the, the fringes with the blue cord in it um, that's commanded for us. Um, that we would have those on the edges of our garment. And, 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 and what the TT does is reminds us to keep the commandments of God. Because people didn't have like the Bibles that they can carry around with them like we do now. They didn't have it on their phones. Because people didn't have the phones and the smartphones and things like that. So they needed a reminder to keep the law of God. And that was that constant reminder. But it is also a symbol of someone's commitment. To keep the law, to keep the Torah. And it's spoken of, I actually have taught on this earlier in this series. It's spoken of in Malachi chapter 4, which is Malachi 3 in the complete Jewish Bible, about the fact that the sun will rise with healing in his wings. And that word kanaf is the same word that, was, that demonstrates what the titsi is and where it is. That the healing is connected right there. So many versions says it's the fringe of his garment, but it was really on his titsi. That the woman grabs hold. She grabs hold to this titsi. And immediately she is healed. And she can feel that healing from within her body. Now verse 45. I love what Yeshua does. Yeshua asked who touched me? When they all denied doing it. Kepha replied. That's Peter. Rabbi the crowds are hemming you in and jostling you. 
But Yeshua said, someone did touch me because I felt power go out from me. Now, everybody's touching him. This is what Peter's saying. He's like, everybody's touching you. They're this close. They're all touching you. How can you mean, you know, who's touching me? Yeshua means someone reached out and grabbed hold of me. They withdrew from me. She is really right there at his feet and she withdraws a virtue from him and he feels it. That's what heals her. That's who he's looking for. When we touch him, when we're at his feet, when we're worshiping, when we're seeking him, he feels it. He has an interaction with us. He's touched and then he seeks us out. Because he wants more than for us to draw from his virtue. He wants relationship with us. And he wants to restore even our identities. That is complete revival. Oh, I'm so excited because I'm completely experiencing that in my life right now. In my walk with him. Now, this is what happens. Verse 47. Seeing that she could not escape notice, the woman quaking with fear threw herself down before him and he confessed in front of everyone why she had touched him and how she'd been instantly healed. He said to her, my daughter, your trust has saved you. Go in peace. Now, this is essential. We've got to understand this because he was a, a, a teacher, a rabbi at the time. And the Torah expressly says that a teacher is not supposed to touch anything dead, anyone hemorrhaging. Like it's actually in the law. Because it would defile the rabbi, it would defile the priest, it would defile the teacher. So they're not supposed to touch someone dead, they're not supposed to touch someone hemorrhaging, they're not supposed to touch someone with leprosy, uh, because it would defile them. He's keeping his people pure and, and free of disease. So that when they're laying hands on people, they're not spreading contaminants and diseases. Now Yeshua is the master, and so there's nothing that can touch him that can defile him. Instead, he cleanses us when we touch him. That's how higher he is than, than human teachers and, and, and human revelation. He's above all of that, that nothing can defile him, but he cleanses that which touches him. But it was not enough for him that she was healed in her body. He wanted her to be healed in her soul. He wanted her identity to be healed because the 12 years that she was hemorrhaging, she couldn't worship. She couldn't go to temple because she would defile it with her hemorrhaging. So she was cast out from the assembly of God's believers, of God's people, from the family of faith. She was estranged. And this is why she's confessing and weeping because she's hoping that he's not going to be angry with her for defiling filing him by touching his titi. Instead, he speaks life into her. He draws her by relationship and he affirms who she is. He wants to do that for you, for me today. It's not just about healing our physical bodies or even healing our hearts. He wants to heal every part of us, our minds, our souls. He wants to heal everything within us, our identities, and put us back into a place of purpose so that we might know that touching him is not the wrong thing. It's not a weak thing. It's the only thing that we can do when we are in need of him, which is really every moment of every day. Verse 49, while Yeshua was still speaking, a man came from the synagogue president's house. Your daughter has died, he said. Don't bother the rabbi anymore. But on hearing this, Yeshua answered him, don't be afraid. Just go on trusting and she will be made well. See, they didn't believe he could revive from death. They thought maybe he could stop death. But they didn't believe he could revive from death. And many of us are in that place where, you know, Lord, if I had maybe known about you earlier in my life, I wouldn't have sinned so much and messed it up so bad. If I had really known about your ways, I, you know, maybe there would have been some hope for me. But I, it's too bad now. It's too desperate now. I've done too much. It's just I'm too far away from you. This can't be salvaged. This can't be changed. There's nothing that can be done in this scenario. And the Lord is saying, just keep believing me because my power far exceed, exceeds what you can conceive. He can do way more than we think that he can do. Way more than we've been allowing and, and, and agreeing with him to do in our lives. So he's saying, don't worry about it. I've got this. Just watch me work and believe. Agree with me in faith. Because he does seek our agreement. How can two walk together unless they be agreed? He's not looking to be a magic act. Or a performer for us where he does things outside of our agreement with him. Instead, he wants us to welcome his works and walk in agreement with him that he's doing things through us as well. Not just to us, but through us and with us. That's relationship. And it's not just for our benefit. He loves to relate to us. There was a time where I was in worship and uh, we were singing to him um, every day with you, Lord, is sweeter than the day before. And then I got a vision. I was taken into the heavens past past all of the, 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 the um, planets and past the stars and I'm flying through space and then I'm in the throne room and Yeshua's singing back to us every day with you is sweeter than the day before. He's swinging and he's just, oh, every day with you. I mean, he was all into it. I'm just laughing. I'm in the middle of 
this worship service. I'm just laughing. I'm looking at him singing to us. And I was like, why would you be excited about us? About us fellowshipping with you and us worshiping you? I mean, I know why we're excited because of what we get from it. But why does it excite you? And he said, every day wasn't always like this. And he took me to the cross. And it was like I was flying around it, seeing it from every angle, watching his agony. He says, every day was not like this. But today, I get to fellowship with you. Today, I get to receive your worship. It excites him when we chase after him. It makes his sacrifice well worth it. Because he remembers it like it was yesterday. It's not far removed. And he still knows the pain of his crucifixion and his estrangement from the Father. He knows it very well. He allowed me to feel it in that one interaction, just, just for a moment, just a bit of it, to let me know that it encourages his heart when we're excited about worshiping him, when we give him true worship. It, he enjoys it. And so we've got to understand that what he does for us is not a handout. It's an interaction. It blesses him because he's doing what he was designed to do and empowering us to do what we were designed to do in relationship with him. Not separate, but in relationship. Now let's watch him do what he's designed to do for uh, the synagogue president's daughter. This is Jairus. We saw it in in, um, in Matthew. We see his name spoken. Um, I believe it is. Now, look at this. Verse 51, he continues. He says, when he arrived at the house... He didn't allow anyone to go in with him except Kepha, Yochanan, and Yaakov. That's going to be Peter, James, and John. Or Peter, John, and James. And the child's father and mother. Now, the reason he did that is because those who didn't have faith couldn't be in the room. We actually read it in another version. And he spoke very clearly to me about that. If their faith wasn't meeting him in the air where he was, uh, in that heavenly place, they were going to bring doubt and death. And he was bringing life and wholeness. And he needed people to agree with him on that. And those five, because it was in the father and mother's best interest, they wanted her alive. And, and, and their passion and zeal and love for her would, would, would agree with him and his passion and zeal and love for her. And then Peter, James, and John would agree in faith because they know he was able. Verse 52. All the people were wailing and mourning for her. See, that's why they couldn't come in. Because they're stuck on the death. She's there, she's there, she's there. They were stuck on the death. You gotta let death go before we can receive life. We have to let death go. Release death. Get rid of it. Take off the morning clothes. Then you can receive the joy. The joy of your salvation. The joy of restoration. He said, don't weep. She hasn't died. She's sleeping. They jeered at him. But since they knew she had died, this is why they're jeering. And at this point, I remember asking, Lord, you know, that was a lie. You know, she was dead. You said, don't, don't, don't weep because she's not dead. She's sleeping. The Lord said, True, he is truth, and truth is what he speaks. The lie is the doubt that we hear from the enemy. And because they had proclaimed death, he had to speak a different word. And the word he spoke was sleeping. He had to speak something different so that it would denounce and cast out all of those words of death, death, death. She's dead, she's dead, she's dead. They had proclaimed it over her. So he had to cast those words down and cast them out and proclaim a different word, which was sleeping. Because if you're sleeping, you can be awakened. And though you may feel dead and things in your life may look dead, Yeshua has not said dead. He said sleeping. And he's going to wake it up. And I love that because right now we're enacting, uh, we're walking through this Awakening the Bride movement. That whole wedding, wedding feast that I'm telling you about is our Awakening the Bride movement. The bride is not dead. She's sleeping. And he's ready to wake her up. And I love it so much. It blesses me so much. Now, uh, verse 54. He took her by the hand, called out, little girl, get up. And her spirit returned. She stood up at once and he directed that something be given to her to eat. Because he's proving she's alive. She's, she needs to be filled. Fill her. And that's important for us too. If he brings something back to life, fill it. Do what he's told you to do to keep it alive. Don't allow death to seep back in. Keep the fire going. Verse 56. Her parents were astounded. But he instructed them to tell no one what had happened because he didn't want people just chasing him just for miracles. He wants them to receive the truth. Chapter 9. Calling together the twelve, Yeshua gave them power and authority to expel all demons and to cure diseases. And he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal. He said to them, take nothing for your trip, neither a walking stick nor a pack. 
neither bread nor money, and don't have two shirts. That means just the shirt on your back. That's all you need. Whatever house you enter, stay there and go out from there. Wherever they don't welcome you, shake the dust from your feet when you leave that town as a warning to them. They set out and went through village after village, healing and announcing the good news everywhere. Now that promise and what he did for them is also for us. After he revives you individually, let him send you that he can revive others. Heal the sick, raise the dead, proclaim the truth of the kingdom, cast out demons. Why? Because if he can do it in your life, he can do it through you in someone else's life. That is the victory. That's the power of the overcoming. That not only am I pulled up and out, but I am empowered to pull somebody else up and out. That is how we let our light shine. And that's how we incite revival. My personal revival minister to you that you might be revived as well. And we go out into the land and proclaim the truth, demonstrating it with signs, wonders, and miracles. Verse 7. Herod the governor, and this again is going to be the same one, Herod Antipas. Heard about all that was going on and was perplexed because it was said by some that Yochanan had been raised from the dead and by others that Eliyahu or Elijah had appeared and by others that one of the prophets of long ago had come back to life. Herod said, I had Yochanan beheaded. So who is this about whom I keep hearing such things? And, begin, and he began trying to see him. Now, what's important to note because we've read it in other places is that Herod, of course, had John the Baptist, John the Baptizer, Yochan and the Immerser, beheaded in the prison because of his um, wife, Herodias, who was really the wife of his brother, Philip. She had incited her daughter to ask for John the Baptist's head on a platter in front of Herod's birthday guest, and he didn't want to be ashamed, so he had John the Baptist beheaded. Now, what's important to note here is that he is stricken with guilt. This is what's happening. The enemy is condemning him. The Holy Spirit is convicting, but the enemy is condemning, and he's freaking out. Because he's like, I know that was wrong. I know I was wrong to do it. He's part Jewish. He knows the Torah. So he knows he's wrong. However, his sin won't bring him to fully repent. So he's trying to find Yeshua, but not for repentance. He's trying to calm that guilt within him. And, and make sure that it's not John the Baptist come to torment him. That's really what's happening. And that is not how we get revival. It's not so that I can feel better about my sin. It's not so that I don't have to worry about, you know, uh, something getting me because there is punishment for sin. It's so that I can be refreshed in my relationship with God and turn back to him. I can repent and be restored. That's what it's about. And because he was looking for the wrong reasons, the only time he's going to see him is right before Yeshua's crucifixion. And Yeshua is not going to have one word to say to him because he knows that he's not really trying to be repentant. And we've got to search our hearts to make sure we're not in the same condition. Verse 10. On their return, the emissaries detailed to Yeshua what they had done. Then taking them with him, he withdrew, he withdrew by himself to a town called Bethsaida. Or Bethsaida. Um, but the crowds found out and followed him. Welcoming them, he went on to speak to them about the kingdom of God and to heal those who needed to be healed. The day began to draw to a close. The twelve came to him and said, send the crowd away so they can go and get lodging and food in the towns and farms around here. Because where we are is a remote place. But he said to them, give them something to eat yourselves. They said, we have no more than five loaves of bread and two fish, unless we ourselves are supposed to go and buy food for all these people. Now, of course, you know, they don't they don't understand that he's about to um, bless the people physically, just like he's revived them spiritually. For there were about 5,000 men, so they're just like, you know, what are we going to do? He said to the Talmudim, the disciples, make them sit down in groups of about 50 each. They did what he told them, and he had them all sit down. Then he took the five loaves and the two fish, and looking up to heaven, he made a bracha, which is a blessing, um, and which is going to bless the Father. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu Melechah Olam. He's speaking, blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe. Not bless the bread. Blessed are you who made the bread. Blessed are you who made the fish. We're blessed, he's blessing the Father. Now, he broke the loaves and began, and he began giving them to the Dalmadim to distribute to the crowd. Everyone ate as much as he wanted, and they took up what was left over, 12 baskets full of broken pieces. Now, that's a sign of revival. You get fed spiritually and physically. Miracles are happening, and the Lord himself is meeting every need. That is what's occurring. The, the, the people with him, the Talmudim, did not have faith for that part of the revival. They believed for the healing and deliverance, but physical manifestations, prosperity, abundance. What? I don't know if that could happen. I, I'm still used to our lack. I'm still used to us not having enough. I'm, I'm used to having to scrape for and work for and strive for everything I get. I, I don't know if you can move in this kind of way. I've seen, you know, people raised from the dead, but feeding 5,000 men with their wives and children, I don't know about that. And we can be that same way. 
We apply faith to certain areas. And money is one where we tend to have a lot of doubt. Because we know, you know, a man doesn't work, he doesn't eat. You know, I might not have employment. I might not have this. I might not have that. So, you know, how am I going to sustain myself and my family? The Lord knows. He blesses our efforts, certainly. We shouldn't sit back on our laurels and just wait for it to fall out of the sky. But when we're following him and doing what he says to do, he makes things multiply. He stretches. He expands. He provides everything we need. And I love it. That's Matthew 6. So beautiful. Don't worry about what you eat or what you drink or, 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 or how you'll be clothed or housed because the Lord knows what you need before you ask him. We've got to just seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and then all these things will be added unto us as well. And we see this is what's happening with this crowd. They sought the Lord first. They weren't worried about what they were going to eat. But because they sought him, he met that need also. He'll do the same in our lives as well it's a, as a sign of the revival. Believe him for that as well. Now, right before this happens, he takes the time of leading the disciples off to a, a, a remote place because he's allowing them to rest and be refreshed. That's important in revival too. That as we're ministering and ministering and ministering, that we pull away and we let God refresh us. We pray, we, we worship, we, we rest. Rest from our working. I've seen so many revivals die out because there was no rest. I saw that with Lakeland. I actually read the book of the pastor of the church um, down there doing that revival. And one thing that they did not have was times of rest. They were having worship every day, all day. And nobody was being refreshed and nobody was resting. Because there was such a, a, a portal to the heavenly realms and God was just pouring out, they were kind of afraid if we stop, we come back, it might not still be open. So they just kept going and going and going until everyone was exhausted. And when humans are exhausted, our flesh actually rises up and starts to fight us more than we should be fighting. And, and, and we need that rest. We've got to pull away and pray. Seek God. Be refreshed in our minds. Be refreshed in our bodies. Let him heal us. Because things will try to attach themselves to us. The enemy will send all types of darts and, 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 and wrong messages and confusion and, and temptations. We saw that in Lakeland as well. And we won't be able to stand up against those temptations because we're not retreating to him for rest. Rest is essential for revival. I believe him, yes. I do what he's showing me to do. But I also pull away to him for rest and refreshing. Then when I get that rest and refreshing, my faith will be restored. And because the people found them when they were trying to retreat, the disciples didn't get the rest. They seen, you know, demons cast out and they've been out two by two just doing this great work, but they didn't get the rest because the people showed up before they got to rest. So their faith hadn't been restored yet. So they're in this place of doubt and weariness uh, where they should have been refreshed and ready um, to, to minister more, to do the next thing. But they didn't get the refreshing. Get your refreshing. Get what you need from the Lord to be revived and revitalized to continue to sustain what he's doing in you and around you. Verse 18. Once when Yeshua was praying in a private place, his Talmudim were with him and he asked them, Who are the crowds saying I am? They answered, Yochanan the Immerser, but others say Eliyahu, and others that some prophet of long ago has arisen. But you, he said to them, who do you say I am? Kepha answered, the Mashiach of God, that's the anointed one of God. However, he warned them, ordered them to tell this to no one, adding, the son of man has to endure much suffering and be rejected by the elders, the head called named the priest. And the Torah teachers, the teachers of the law. And he has to be put to death. But on the third day, he has to be raised to life. Now he said has to. When God says something, believe him. It might not match up with our thinking or our planning. We might not think, well, you can't sustain revival that way. You know, this great stuff and you're going to die. It doesn't make sense. Sometimes he says to us, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to bring more death of your flesh in the midst of all this. And we might not think we can sustain any more death of our flesh. But if he says it, believe him. Just agree and let him work it out in us. So we've seen very clearly in other versions that, of course, uh, Peter didn't, didn't agree. He takes him to the side and he goes, Lord, you know, let this never be. And so the Lord has to respond in like manner. We'll see what happens in this response, starting in verse 23, that he has to respond to this doubt um, and disagreement that Peter has with him because he doesn't agree that this has to be done. Yeshua said has to. Has to. He has to be handed over. Has to die. Has to be raised to life. So that means it's already written in the plan. There's nothing we can do about it but agree with God and seek him for the strategy to walk it out. Verse 23. Then to everyone he said, this is Yeshua, if anyone wants to come after me, let him say no to himself. Take up his execution stake, his cross, daily and keep following me. 
For whoever tries to save his own life will destroy it. But whoever destroys his life on my account will save it. What will it benefit a person if he gains the whole world but destroys or forfeits his own life? For if someone is ashamed of me and what I say, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his glory and that of the Father and of the holy angels. I tell you the truth. There are some people standing here who will not experience death until they see the kingdom of God. So now he's speaking of eternal life and the fact that they will continue on with him forever. And he's gonna, they're going to see this, this glory of the king coming back uh, um, to collect his bride, which is so beautiful. And it's important to note here that though we are revived, Paul says, I die to myself daily. I die daily. I'm forever being crucified. Yeshua is saying, let that flesh be crucified. Don't try to do your plan to enact God's will. It's not going to work. Instead, let you die. Your plans die. Your goals die. Let them die so that God's can be revived. He, he actually had me reading about David earlier today who wanted to build a temple for God. He's like, I'm living in a house of cedar and the glory of God. The Ark of the Covenant is in a tent. I want to build my house. Nathan the prophet is like, go ahead and do it. Whatever you want to do, God's going to bless it. But then God comes back to Nathan and says, no, tell David he's not the one to do it. But I'm going to build David a house. God sometimes says no to our beautiful, elaborate plans of what we want to do for him. He says, that's not what I want. But I love you and I'm still going to bless you. But I'm going to do my will because that's what's going to bring revival and restoration, not your will. So let our wills, our dreams, our plans die. Not so much that there's no hope. But we surrender them for crucifixion that he might revive the true hopes and plans and dreams. Those that are really of him. And the truth is, when he does it, it will resound with our spirits. It won't seem foreign. He told David, I'm going to sustain your throne forever. That resounded with David. And he said, I'm all right with that. That's okay with me. If you don't let me build a temple, you're sustaining my throne forever. And then you're going to send my son and allow him to build a temple. That's all right with me. We've got to have that same agreement in our spirits with the Lord as well. Verse 28. About a week after Yeshua said these things, he took Kepha, Yochanan, and Yaakov with him and went up to the hill country to pray. As he was praying, the appearance of his face changed and his clothing became gleaming white. Suddenly there were two men talking with him, Moshe and Eliyahu. That's Moses and Elijah. They appeared in glorious splendor and spoke of his exodus, which he was soon to accomplish in Yerushalayim. Now, exodus, departure, leaving. That was the time of his crucifixion and death. He, they spoke of the fact that he was going to leave the earth and be, uh, and be back into the heavenly realms. Now, <clears throat> Kepha and those with him had been sound asleep, but on becoming fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men standing with him. As the men were leaving, Yeshua, Kepha said to him, not knowing what he was saying, it's good that we're here, Rabbi. Let's put up three shelters. One for you, one for Moshe, and one for Eliyahu. And he's trying to fulfill the scriptures by keeping the Mashiach and the witnesses here on the earth. Because he's read that in Zechariah. That, that there would be those two witnesses that would be there with the lampstand. He's read it. He understands those two olive trees that would stand right by the lampstand pouring oil into it. And this is what's happening. Moshe and Eliyahu are fulfilling this. He's seeing it. He said, let, let's keep it here. This is awesome. Let it be fulfilled. But this is really just a precursor. He's just revealing what's going to come. This is not the time of the glorification. It's just a revelation that is going to come. Verse uh, 34. As he spoke, a cloud came and enveloped them. They were frightened as they entered the cloud. The cloud, And a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my son whom I have chosen. Listen to him. That's important. That means we got to read those words in red and take them to heart. If Yeshua said it, it's the truth. And that's it. It's, that settles it. They kept quiet. When the voice spoke, Yeshua was alone once more. They kept quiet. At that time, they told no one anything of what they had seen. It wasn't until later. The next day, as they were coming down out of the hill country, a, loud, a large crowd came and met them. Suddenly, a man in the crowd shouted, Rabbi, look at my son, I beg you, because he's my only child. What happens is this. A spirit seizes him, and suddenly it lets out a shriek and throw a shriek and throws him into convulsions with foaming at the mouth. And only with difficulty will it leave him. It's destroying him. Again, we see death. This demonic oppression is killing this boy. I asked your Talmudim to drive the spirit out, but they couldn't. This man needs revival. His son needs revival for his family to be revived in their hope and their faith. Perverted people without trust. Yeshua answered, how long do I have to be with you and put up with you? 
bring your son here. Now he's saying that because it's the lack of faith, it's the doubting that has caused the spirit to stay, the demonic spirit to stay. It's not that the authority wasn't there or the power wasn't there. The, the, the Talmudim had just been casting out demons two by two all over the land. So clearly the authority is there. He gave them the authority, but the doubt is there. The fear is there. The lack of trust is there. And he's speaking to the father and also to the Talmudim. There has to be more faith. Now, um, verse 42, even as the boy was coming, the demon dashed him to the ground and threw him into a fit because he's not trying to leave. The demon's not trying to leave. But Yeshua rebuked the unclean spirit, healed the boy and gave him back to his father. All was struck with amazement at the greatness of God. Now, it's so interesting because in another version, it talks about this father saying, uh, forgive my unbelief. He says, I do believe, forgive my unbelief. And so we know that that doubt was actually a, a cause, a root cause of the fact that the son was not being delivered. Now, <clears throat> while they were marveling at everything Yeshua was doing, he said to his Talmudim, listen very carefully at what I'm going to say. The Son of Man is about to be betrayed into the hands of men. But they didn't understand what he meant by this. It had been concealed from, from them so that they would not grasp its meaning. And they were afraid to ask him about it. An argument arose among the Talmudim as to which of them might be the greatest. But Yeshua, knowing the thoughts of their hearts, took a child, stood him beside himself, and said to them, Whoever welcomes this child in my name welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. In other words, the one who is least among you all, this is the one who is great. Yochanan responded, Rabbi, we saw someone expelling demons in your name, and we stopped him because he doesn't follow you along with us. Yeshua said to him, Don't stop such people, because whoever isn't against you is for you. That is important for us as well. We're not the only bringers of revival. We're not the only keepers of this great fire of God. He's using people all over the world. We've got to unite, link up, support each other, pray for each other, and be blessed by what he's doing in everyone else. It's not just about what he's doing in us. It's also about what he's doing in the bride globally. We want to connect and support that because it's been a blessing that he's poured it out to us. Shouldn't others be blessed that he's poured it out to them as well? Regardless of whether they're part of our group, our denomination, our culture, this shouldn't matter to us. They're brothers and sisters in the kingdom because they profess the same uh, faith that we profess. They're the same beliefs, the same Bible, the same spirit that we have. And so we should connect and support. We should bless and not curse. Because it's the work of God, not the work of man. Verse 51. As the time approached for him to be taken up to heaven, he made his decision to set out for Yerushalayim. He sent messengers ahead of him who went and entered a village in Shomron or Samaria um, to make preparations for him. However, the people there would not let him stay because his destination was Yerushalayim. Let me tell you what this is about. The Jews in Jerusalem, Yerushalayim, Yehuda, don't they don't have any fellowship with the Samaritans at this point. We see that in John chapter 4 as well. And it's because the Samaritans were a mixed breed. They were of the those who the Assyrians had brought in during the time of Israel's exile of the northern kingdom. And so some of them were Israeli, um, of the original 12 tribes. Um, and then they had some Israeli blood, but then they also had this mixed pagan blood. And their worship looked just like that. They had worship of the one true God of Israel, but also a lot of pagan worship was mixed in. They worshiped God, uh, the God of Israel, and other pagan gods. So the Jews in the southern kingdom of Judah didn't have anything to do with them. They didn't want to do anything with them. And so when the Samaritans realized that Yeshua is not just coming to them, he's going through their region to Yerushalayim, to Jerusalem, they're feeling like he's taking sides in this matter. Now, of course, he was coming to them also, but then also to Jerusalem. But they've been wounded. They feel estranged from God and his people. And so they feel like he is instead, you know, choosing Jerusalem over them. And really, he's going to Jerusalem to be crucified. He's not going there for some great old party or to celebrate those who are there. He's walking into his destiny. But because they feel left out and because they don't feel like they're part of this chosen group and they've been ostracized and they're still wounded from it, they actually cast Yeshua off as well. Now, Verse 54, when the Talmudim, Yaakov and Yochanan saw this, they said, Sir, do you want us to call down fire from heaven to destroy them? But he turned and rebuked them, which is so important. And some manuscripts don't have the rest, um, but in some it does. And it says, and he said, you don't know what spirit you are of. For the Son of Man did not come to, to destroy people's lives, but to save. And it continues. And they went on to another village. Now, what's important to note about this, we just talked about 
the oneness, the unity that we must have, the support we've got to give to God's people in the kingdom, the fact that we've got to speak blessings, speak blessing words over other kingdom citizens, over other believers, and not curses, not criticisms, not judgments. Instead, we've got to bless what God is doing them, support it. In the name of Yeshua, be unified. It's very important. We see what's happening here is that they're believing, okay, these guys are not receiving the word that, you know, the message of the kingdom that you're bringing. You told us to shake off the dust when we went in the towns and people didn't receive us. How much more so should these people be disciplined? Because shaking off the dust is really, you're pronouncing like a curse on the town because you're saying, I don't even want to take the dust of this town with me because there may not be any dust left when the Lord finishes with you. That's pretty much what you're saying. I don't want the, the, the dust of this unclean place, this rebellious place to even connect with me. I want all the dust to stay here because it may not even be dust left. When God himself finishes disciplining this place. That's what that shaking the dust off means. It's really a curse upon a place that is rebelling against God. So they're saying, look, if that place got cursed because they didn't believe in you through us. And you're actually here and they won't even let you in. You want to call down fire from heaven? And, and they're actually, you know, they're, they're, they're quoting the Torah because Eliyahu, Elijah, actually does that. He calls down fire from heaven um, in 2 Kings chapter 1. Um, verses 9 through 16. And so they're they're actually quoting that and they're they're thinking, well, you know, we should do the same things that Eliyahu did. But the Lord is like, listen, one greater than Eliyahu, Elijah, is here. And I'm telling you, I came to save lives, not to destroy them. If they don't want to receive me, that's their choice. And if I leave them with that choice, then they have an opportunity in the future to receive me later. Let us not judge and criticize those who reject the truth. Because the Lord himself is the only one who knows how many times they'll need to hear that truth and see it demonstrated before they'll have enough of, of the fallow ground and their hearts ripped up that they might receive it and allow it to be planted in them. He is the only one who knows how long it will take for people to receive salvation. And he is the only one who is right and worthy enough to judge when people reject the truth. For us, we're just the messengers. We are to drop the seed and move away. If they choose to reject the seed, that's between them and God, not between us and them. How they, they, they receive it, what they do with it, not even our business. Our job is to plant the seed and let him water it. If they decide to uproot it and throw it away, let him deal with it because he knows their end from the beginning. We don't. We know our role in their lives for just a season. So we've got to just do that part, do that job, and then pray that he would finish his work in their lives should they choose to receive it. That is, again, important in revival because if I've got all in my heart, against those who didn't receive it. If I'm wounded by people who reject the truth and I take it personally, the wound in me will stifle the revival that God is doing. Instead, I'm to move by the Spirit. If I'm prohibited from ministering somewhere because people have rejected the truth, then I ask God for the open door somewhere else. That continues the revival because a lot of times people can be provoked to jealousy when they see God working somewhere else. They go, oh, wow, look at this. Okay, maybe we do need to receive this truth. And they've, get, they've been given another opportunity. And what if God wants to use us with people who previously rejected the truth that came from our mouths? If we're wounded, we won't give them the truth in the right heart and in the right way. We will resist what God is doing and we will stifle the revival in their lives and even the continuing of the revival in our own. Because of the judgment and the woundedness um, and, 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 and um, the bitterness and the resentment that will well up in us because we've taken personally their rejection of God's truth. Let us not take it personally. And the only way I can do that is staying connected to him. If I keep touching and grabbing forth of his teeth seat, he will heal me of that rejection that comes when people don't want what God is ministering through me. Now, let's continue because we're just going to finish up chapter 9. We only have a few more verses left. Um, verse 57. As they were traveling on the road, a, a man said to them, I will follow you wherever you go. And he's talking to Yeshua. Yeshua answered him, The foxes have holes, and the birds flying about have nests, but the Son of Man has no home of his own. Now, in this particular analogy or um, simile, metaphor, what Yeshua is saying is that I don't have a constant living place. I'm on the move all the time. That is my ministry. If you want to follow me, that's going to be your lifestyle too. And some of us, we know God has called us to something, but the lifestyle changes are what keep us from saying, yes, I don't want to uproot my family. I don't want to change my life. I don't want to change my diet. I don't want to change my habits. I don't want to change what I worship because sometimes he'll have a shift there. I don't want to change geographic locations, even though I've been called to another nation or state or people group. I don't want to change that. Those lifestyle changes oftentimes will prohibit us from saying yes. And this was true with this man. He, he already knew it. He's like, I, I know you like the message and I know you like the glory of being around me, but you're going to have to change your life to connect with what I'm doing 
and I know that, that you're not ready for it. So he lets him know from the beginning so he can count the cost. That he would know it, it's not going to be the same. From the day you say yes, everything's going to change. And that's true for us as well. It may be in a different way, but it's true for us as well. Verse 59. The other, to another he said, follow me. But the man replied, sir, first let me go away and bury my father. Yeshua said, let the dead bury their own dead. You go and proclaim the kingdom of God. So he's saying this is about revival, man. It's not about who's dying. It's about who's living. And we want to bring them back to life. Stop focusing on that which is dying and focus on the life that I'm bringing. This is what Yeshua is saying. If he said, can we go to revive my father? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Let's go bring him back. He should have been all ready for that. Let's go. But you're planning for his death. You, you're, he's dead. He's gone. Your mind is still on death, but you want to follow me, the giver of life? The one who is life. He's the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the father except by him. He's like, your focus is wrong. Don't focus on, dead, on death and the dead. Focus on the life and the living. That's what I need you to do. And that's true in our ministries too. We can focus so much on the down, uh, the down times and the warfare and the attacks and the people who didn't say yes and the people who went back into their sin that we miss that he has just sprouted life all around us and we don't give him praise for it. That keeps us refreshed when we look at that life and we worship him for it. Verse 61. Yet another said, I will follow you, sir, but first let me say goodbye to the people at home. To him, Yeshua said, no one who puts his hand to the plow and keeps looking back is fit to serve in the kingdom of God. Now, again, we've been talking about faith for revival today. And so it's become, going to become very, very important that I commit to God's revival work in me, in my family, my household, my marriage, my ministry, and in my region. As I commit to God's revival work, he can keep me fresh and refreshed that I won't turn back. Because he said very clearly that I'm not fit to serve if I keep going back to my old life, my old ways, my, my old thoughts. I should be forward looking, forward moving, thinking on life, meditating on things that are above, not below, and not worrying about that which is behind me. Is it a part of my testimony? Yes. Does it propel me into my purpose? Yes. But it does not dictate where he's taking me. It's just a stepping stone that I can go higher in him. And so he needs us to let some things go. There's some people, some places, some things we've got to let go. Some bitterness, some hurt, some resentment, we've got to let go. There's some mindsets that we've got to let go. It's time. He wants a fresh renewal, a revival, a fresh relationship with us. Those things that are dead, they've got to go. Because he came to bring life and life more abundantly. Let us join him in the bringing of life. That is faith for revival. Because faith without works is dead. I'm believing him and I'm joining him in the work. If you want to know more about this, the reading that you should continue for today is going to be Isaiah 61. Yeshua actually uh, quoted it when he was speaking back to Yochanan. You know, when Yochanan had the question, you know, is it you that we should be hoping for or someone else coming? When he had that question, when Yeshua gives that reply back about all the things that are happening, um, one of the chapters that he quotes is Isaiah 61. There are a few other chapters in Isaiah that he quotes as well. But read Isaiah 61 and you're going to see the portion of it that he quoted when he gave his reply back to Yochanan. But you will also be encouraged in uh, uh, faith for revival. Encouraged to stay connected to the true vine that he can use you to bring things back to life. I hope also that you will join us soon. Uh, visit our website, truthandspirit.org, um, that you can know what's coming and that you might be refreshed to be a refresher to others. I look forward to speaking with you, ministering to you more next week as he continues us in this journey on Yeshua and the Gospels.